Hello everybody and thank you for joining today. This is your host Nino and in this episode we shall be having a closer view on the proposed European regulation on artificial intelligence also known as the EU AI Act. A planned piece of legislation which is not yet out in its final form but which is clearly drawing towards its final stages. Before we delve into the matter though, please allow me to state a couple of prolegomena. First, this is not constituting legal advice. This is just a presentation of a couple of my own views for the purposes of a legal discussion, which I would be very happy to have with you in the comments to this video, if you have different views and uh, angles of perception of this whole affair. For indeed, this is the purpose of this video, I can say, yeah, to have a bit of an in-depth exchange on this topic. Second, this is not going to be a summary. This is really going to be quite a deep dive. I'm not being able to present each and every article. I will be skipping in particular a lot of organizational topics. But this is not going to be one of those more superficial things. So if you're not really into a deeper discussion of this, then this video is not for you. But if you want to know details, I kindly invite you to stay on. Third, this video does not uh, represent the views of my employer. This is my own private exercise and everything you hear or see here is really just out of my own doing and I do not speak for anyone else. With this out of the way, let's first look a little bit at the whole frame of the thing and like how the whole thing fits together, what, what documents have happened before it and just to give you a little bit of an overview before we get into the details. Now, one can say the first thing which makes an impression is the large quantity of requirements. And the second thing which makes an impression, unfortunately, is the degree of specificity, which is low or in some way strange. Like some of the requirements are weird. I'll just come after uh, to this afterwards. So from this, it follows when you're having a large quantity of hard to specify requirements, the question of interplay of rules. And that remains to be seen. That is what relates to what in what fashion. Now, my pet peeve so far, for instance, is that the notion of a provider of an artificial intelligence system is dynamic. In other words, uh, this may be one entity, but can be changing to a different entity. All right, so it's not clearly constant that one entity is the provider. However, the duties which are foreseen for the provider of an AI system in their nature are somewhat static. And how this will really work out in practice remains to be seen. The regulation itself is attempting full harmonization. In other words, this is a European law which shall be directly applicable and shall need no implementation by the individual European member states, nor are they in fact expected to release any rules countervening it, gold plating it, or anything further in that direction. For its interpretation, there are two further documents which are noteworthy in particular if you want to know about the aims and the history of creation of this law namely the white paper on artificial intelligence as well as the assessment list for trustworthy artificial intelligence or altai and these two documents we shall indeed have a look at before we delve into the details of the eu ai act itself for they are outlining a lot of the directions of regulation, which you then later see reflected in the proposed law itself. Now, starting with the white paper, 
on artificial intelligence. It can be said that its aims are noble without question. It shall foster efficiency and research and production farming, uh, the adop uh, adaption to and mitigation of climate change, healthcare, farming, security, and so on and so forth. One can even say pay attention to those topics because maybe in the future, these being stated aims of this act, they will receive even further and more particular attention. Moreover, the European Commission here aims to curtail bias and discrimination as could be perpetuated by the use of AI systems. What also immediately makes an impression is the very broad definition of what artificial intelligence really is. And indeed, it is said to be that artificial intelligence is a collection of technologies that combine data, algorithms, and computing power. And that, of course, immediately throws the question, what is not AI? Like, this definition is indeed so broad that when you think of it, even using a calculator could be seen as a form of employing an artificial intelligence, right? You're having there algorithms to compute, let's say, the square root, you're having computing power, though it's not particularly high, and you're having data, which you're just, you know, entering and, and reading off the screen the results, hoping that the calculator is not lying when it multiplies three times uh, one third, which may end up as being 0 0.9999, right? So that is certainly something which I see a little bit critically because I believe it misses sort of the point of what AI is in its normal deployment. Namely, artificial intelligence is really used to replace human discretion. That is, things which normally would be decided and estimated by a human being are decided and estimated in a somewhat intransparent way quite often by an artificial intelligence. And the problematic aspect of this evidently is, is this estimation apt and proper? That's the real question. So going for a collection of technologies that combine data, algorithms, and computing power does not express, in my view, sufficiently that the question is about human discretion replacement. Now, what they want to do is to establish the European Union as a global leader in innovation and the data economy. And the real background of that is that the European Union has detected a large increase of the deployment of artificial intelligence solutions. But at the same time, they bemoan uh, an underuse of available data. So the stated aim of the regulation is to facilitate the use of this data, but according to European values. To this end, two policy keys are established, which are called excellence and trust. <laughs> oh my God, like this, this speak is just really great. But when you look at what is behind these policy keys, that's not entirely harmless. Indeed, both policy keys could have been <laughs> perchance also named oversight and control, <laughs> something like that. So the aim will be partially to establish excellence and testing centers or sandboxes in order to combine investments and and uh, foster control and oversight of the development of artificial intelligence systems. Regarding the trust component, you're having quite a lot of bureaucracy being introduced, in particular with regard to safety, privacy, 
data governance and diversity as well as non-discrimination and also accountability, etc., etc. So that's what I meant with a lot of requirements, but what exactly is behind accountability? What exactly is behind data governments? What exactly means non-discrimination and so on? That will be left to the practice to, to be determined. In particular, behind the element of data governance, there is a strong element of, of distrust or fear that an artificial intelligence system could be used somehow for societal control, de-anonymization, and the meeting of intractable decisions which are biased and, and which are disadvantageous to endangered groups of people. And the comparison of the whole thing goes towards product liability, where you're saying that in the end there were rules established how to handle dangerous products of physical nature, so why not create rules which will handle dangerous artificially intelligent systems? Which is why further requirements are being raised, such as reproducibility. I'm going to go into that in a moment again, but that's not a harmless requirement because there are a lot of systems whose actions are not easily reproducible. And further required is robustness. What is robustness? When are you sure that your system is robust? Accuracy. Is accuracy something with a degree and what degree? Information requirements and oversight requirements, right, are also there. And as I mentioned already, it is compared to, to product regulation, but it is mentioned also by the European Commission that this product regulation does not fit well neither software nor services. And moreover, one should also pay attention to the potential of changes in functionality which indeed may render a system which was once useful, perhaps harmful in the future. You can even imagine it with something as easy as a typing correction software, so like something to, to handle typing mistakes with. If you click add to dictionary all the wrong words all the time, then in the end the software will no longer effectively correct your typical typing mistakes, right? So such things need to be a little bit kept in, to, in, in view. And, of course, from that follows the question of allocation of responsibility, whereby the European Commission aims for a risk-based approach. Now, the risk-based approach really is nothing but the, is the division of artificial intelligence systems essentially into high-risk systems, and all other systems. But as we shall be looking at in a moment, <laughs> it's more than likely for a lot of systems to fall into the high risk category, as it is formulated now, which might not materially necessarily belong there, if we are quite frank. All in all, the white paper looks a little bit as if they were not quite sure what to do with this new animal artificial intelligence. And when speaking of excellence, they, the creators of this paper were speaking of attracting, you know, suitable academics. But what to do with the existing workforce doesn't seem to have a very clear or clean solution. It is in fact said that the role of the social partners should be stressed, which is totally unclear, right? Like what shall that even mean? It is indeed noted by the European Commission that problems concerning the use of AI uh, are particularly the opaqueness and intractability of AI, so that you do not actually exactly know why it met a decision or made a recommendation the way it did it. But unfortunately, let me tell you this, no sufficiently complex system is tractable. Even if its decisions are exactly understandable one by one, 
Once the complexity becomes high enough, you can no longer see what, why exactly something is happening in the big picture. Think of a chess computer. While a chess computer could always nicely argue to you which of the next hundreds or thousands of branches will lead to what results in the future game of chess, it would be difficult for a human being to keep all of those thousands and hundreds of thousands or millions of moves even a couple of steps ahead in mind. So while the machine would be perfectly able to tell you why you should move a pawn or, or a queen somewhere, it's not something which you can really keep an overview on. You can only handle such things by intuition. So demanding an explicable system is not really feasible when the system has transgressed a certain degree of complexity. And so here the effort to attain uh, transparency in highly complex situations, in my view, will be difficult to, to establish in practice, to find the balance. What do you need to tell to your users? Uh, what, what is necessary to be known about the functioning of a system in order to be able to trust it or not? It's not like in the old days in the 1970s where you were having systems which by nature were hard to understand. Let's say uh, something like Bayesian systems or neural network based systems or stuff like that. And systems which you could follow where, where they could give you such chain rules as to why or how they arrived at the result. Because the chain rules over tens of thousands of steps make nothing clear anymore. And while the Commission does indeed acknowledge the existence of evolving systems, which indeed in newer times have gained much more weight and importance in practice, in particular in the area of generative AI, which is constantly developed further through the input uh, of users and their satisfaction with its output, they do not quite seem to have something to grasp it in a regulatory fashion because the issue is this if the purpose of a system is to change then keeping constants about its functionality and reliability is naturally difficult which brings us also to this concept of responsibility because if a system changes its properties sufficiently far that its function becomes undesirable, whom can you truly attribute this fault to? It does appear, of course, somewhat dissatisfactory to say, well, nobody, right? So these are indeed some of the issues which the European Commission is trying to later handle in the proposed EU AI Act, as we shall see later on. And having had a look at this more general overview, it might also be helpful to now have a view on the assessment list for trustworthy artificial intelligence, or ALTAI, which is establishing a couple of guidelines which should be followed in the design, in particular, of high-risk artificial intelligence systems, but generally in the design of AI systems all over. See, one of the cornerstones of the EU AI Act is the distinction between high-risk systems and all other systems where you're saying that particular rules apply to high-risk systems, but it might be all too easy to fall into that category. So the guidelines, which I shall now present to you, really are something to, to keep an eye on in general. So the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence set up by the European Commission has established seven guidelines for the design of AI systems, namely human agency and oversight, technical robustness and safety, privacy and data governance, transparency, diversity, non-discrimination and fairness, societal and environmental well-being, as well as accountability. Sounds lovely, right? 
We're again in a situation where the aims are noble, but the specific content will be hard to establish. What is interesting is that these things no longer just relate to computer scientists or AI experts, but indeed the stakeholders are now also legal and compliance as well as management. So certainly there will be a broader level of responsibility expected from companies which are developing AI systems and it will not be really able, really possible to excuse oneself with, you know, that's a scientific topic I'm not all that well versed in. It is expected that you do become worse, well versed in it. As focal questions are seen negative discrimination, the freedom of expression, data protection and the rights of the child. And if you look at this picture, you see it's just one step away from becoming truly complex when you start to think in detail about all of those topics. I mean, staying for a moment still with the focal questions, what is negative discrimination and how are you avoiding it? Because that really means that your data might suggest conclusions which, for instance, would have a starkly negative effect against communities of, of vulnerable nature. For instance, some minority, some, some community which is exposed to racial discrimination, some, some, some weak persons, some vulnerable persons. And in order to avoid a negative effect against those, people, you really will have to skew and change and adjust your data where that would perhaps appear necessary, which means you are no longer allowing the data to have its initial statistical properties, but you are changing something in order to avoid such discrimination. So that means that somebody needs to sit there and, for instance, categorize who belongs to what race in order to avoid this discrimination of one specific race in order to um, make sure, you know, that, that you do not get societally seen negative results out of your system. But it means you are by necessity engaging in a possibly quite racist Exercise, you, you need to categorize who belongs to this vulnerable minority, right? Because how shall you protect a minority unless you can say who belongs to it? For instance, if you say protect the poor, you'll have to categorize which level of income makes you poor. And you would need, for instance, to label data that way, which might be quite a sensitive topic with regard to the GDPR itself, and not only to the EU AI Act. It is also strange that the GDPR is mentioned as a separate regulation, and that basically you might, in some affairs and questions, have both regimes applicable, and it remains to be seen whether it is in a conflict-free way, because if you try to establish who belongs to what race, then you are certainly handling here highly sensitive data. Similar concerns one may have with the, you know, freedom of expression. Which expression is allowed? You are navigating muddy waters here, somewhere between corporate censorship, when you delete generally accepted and possible expressions or if you allow certain expressions which in certain jurisdictions would be forbidden. There is clearly a great distinction for instance between what still constitutes free speech in, in many countries and, and in many other countries like in some countries certain things you just in no way can say. And for instance Germany is a lot harsher in the prosecution of neo-Nazism than, for instance, well, countries with a stronger stress on the freedom of expression like the United States. And many things which in the U US you still could say in Germany would land you straight in jail. 
Stressing data protection, and that is also something you see throughout the proposed legislation as well, is a weird topic too, because the question then really arises, um, how are these regimes related to each other? That is the EU AI Act and the GDPR. And might there, and that is the particular question, arise the issue of double liability, where you have, you know, messed up something in some way that you become truly liable under both regimes? Or is there some form of specialized application of, let's say, the GDPR for, for certain affairs or not? Like That remains to be seen, because normally such acts are positioned in parallel to each other. None is really the lex specialis to the other. And, and normally you, you can become really doubly liable. So you really do need to keep uh, an eye also on the GDPR, particular with regard to all the topics concerning privacy and data governance and so on and so forth. Regarding technical robustness, you should know that um, this is an extra category. This is not just security in the conventional sense where like hacking is in some form to be prevented, nor is it merely a question of uptime, which you, you often have as reliability, you know, uptime, throughput, things like that. The question here really is expected performance of the system. How easy or difficult is it to trick the AI into providing improper results? And that is a lot harder to manage than um, merely questions which are, you know, solved black and white. Has there been illegitimate access? Is the system down? Things like that. Things like that you can easily estimate. But is the result proper, in particular in a real active system? That's more challenging. Quite connected to this is, of course, the notion of transparency. Transparency, on the one hand, is supposed to be realized through explanations, but here you have to look at, first of all, who the addressees are. Like, you cannot uh, perhaps outline the full degree of complexity to people who are not really all that much into the topic. So, Providing a worthless explanation might not be really an explanation in the sense of the law because it might just not be understandable enough. And there are certain complexity limits, things which just are no longer prone to explaining. Like if you have to explain the weights of a neural network, that's likely simply impossible. What is also interesting is though, and I do miss this indeed in, in many system presentations nowadays, is that you have also to outline the weaknesses of your system. So strengths and weaknesses. What does it do well? What does it not do well? For instance, you can say neural networks commonly are great in handling patterns and pretty terrible in handling logic. What is also desired, but you really have to, to think that through, is reproducibility. So that you, you, so to say, get the same results again. That is indeed only possible in an immutable system fed with the same data. So to really have reproducibility, in theory, you would have to freeze the data and freeze the algorithms. That, however, is in perchance direct contradiction to some other requirements. For instance, if you, if you need to adjust for purposes of security or non-discrimination, then evidently you will no longer have the same algorithms. If you need to clean up data, you will no longer have the same data. So if you, in fact, take care of your system through updates and adjustments, then it might really be that you no longer have reproducibility. So this goal is somewhat in conflict and it remains to be seen in practice how far this is going. And then we're having the societal and environmental well-being where we are having the situation of expected surveillance. That is where the European Commission really does expect providers of artificial intelligence systems to look at them, like for high-risk systems, throughout their lifetime, 
how they are performing and whether they are performing within acceptable limits and to open the door to also supervisory control with regard to such systems. And here the question really does pop up regarding surveillance, but more to that later, because in my view, that is truly one of the more well, problematic issues of the proposed EU AI Act, at least in its present shape. So now that we have seen what, what principles and guidelines and, and ideas are behind the regulation itself, let us jump into the matter itself, into the proper EU AI Act. Now, looking at the EU AI Act proper, what immediately jumps to mind are a couple of principles or observations that it shall be based on proportionality and a risk-based approach. But that is still way less so than in the GDPR. And in fact, reminds more of times before that. Before the GDPR came into force, some countries, in particular like Germany and Austria, had the requirement that data processing systems be registered. And the GDPR did away with all of those overly bureaucratic registration duties, which are now, however, being sort of reintroduced with the UAI Act. So. The proportionality and risk-based approach thing is in some ways expressed but weaker than you might hope. The main expression of it is that the focus of the EU AI Act is on the regulation of high-risk AI systems. But as we shall see, that's a rather broad term. And that is also coupled with a still very broad definition of what artificial intelligence constitutes. And as in several other similar situations, this law is also having extraterritorial effect. In other words, if even if you are situated outside of the EU, the moment you set any foot in the EU, the, the moment they can execute things against you, they will, and so you will be, so to say, indirectly forced to comply with these regulations, even if you're not actually situated in the EU right now, in practice, that is, unless you choose to simply forego the EU as a market. But unfortunately, it's a really rather large market. So the extraterritorial effect is going to be an interesting question because other countries have also started to do things with extraterritorial effect. And when you're having now two, two legal systems clashing that way, then, then it can become rather difficult for you as a private entity to navigate the waters and to figure out how you can comply with, you know, sort of everybody's wishes. For high risk AI systems in particular, you will have to, well, perhaps most importantly, check whether the system is having a possible in impact on the rights, on the fundamental rights of individuals, but these are very broadly defined. So you can rather quickly stumble into that and then you are dealing with a high risk system. And then you need to make an ex ante conformity assessment to see that is whether the system is likely requiring, uh, is likely fulfilling these, um, these requirements of the regulation and you need to update this conformity assessment every time a significant change to the system is introduced. That conformity assessment 
is actually interesting because it might also be needed to be used in a data processing impact assessment according to the GDPR, but by different parties. Because the conformity assessment is finally made by the provider of the system, whereas the data processing impact assessment is made by the users of the system. However, they, the users might need information from the providers in order to be able to make their assessment. What you will find also a little bit weird is um, a, a sort of manic focus uh, on a fear of deep fakes and manipulations uh, which, which simulate reality by, by means of AI. So that's also something the EU AI Act perhaps a little bit weirdly focuses on. Now, perhaps one of the weirder ideas the EU has sort of introduced here, or is trying to introduce here, is the idea of public-private partnerships, and this in particular in the shape of regulatory sandboxes, which are supposed to serve innovation, but I somewhat suspect this will not actually foster innovation, but perchance a little bit hinder it. So what are these? So these are computational environments. You can sort of imagine that like, like cloud computing or something. Spaces in which you can develop and run programs under the guidance of the supervisory authorities. So you can, so to say, that would be the idea, experiment and innovate a little bit with less worries. So the idea is while you are developing your system, if you are having any issues and you're developing it in such a sandbox or like, like regulatory provided space, then you should be able to, to maybe receive guidance on, on what to better do and what to better leave. Now the issue with that is though, you can't get any formal guarantees on that. See, none of the laws which, which you might, so to say, breach foresee some leniency because you are acting in a regulatory sandbox. So, in essence, you get no formal, formal advantage and it is sort of a development under the eye of Sauron without any guarantees that this is in any way safe. This is sort of like a Corleone approach where, where it's like you, you hope for factual advantages if the Don is in the mood, but, but you cannot get any, any guarantees that you won't be punished for, for something which might be seen as a breach of whatever. So I personally doubt whether many private actors will prefer to develop within a regulatory sandbox under the nose of the authority or perhaps simply in a cloud computing environment. Because you see a cloud computing environment can equally scale to whatever you want, but if, if anything goes a little bit awry, you, you, you haven't immediately delivered yourself into the hands of merciless persecution. So what, what struck my mind a little bit is a certain similarity to the situation after the First World War with regard to credit insurance. See, after the First World War, there was very little trust in international trade. And in order to foster in any way economic development and, you know, um, a restoration of, of the world economic order, trade was necessary to be initiated again, but those who wanted to export were just not sure whether the importers will be able to pay, and the importers were not sure whether, whether if they pay, actually anything will be exported towards them at all. To solve that situation, states created or increased or boosted basically state credit insurance. The idea being that the state is guaranteeing, like each state basically to his party, the one for the importer, the other one for the exporter, that they will indemnify said party if the other one is, is really in breach of the contract not fulfilling. And so with these sort of state guarantees, private 
entities were motivated to do business with each other. And frankly, it worked very well. So credit insurance has now, even nowadays, remained one of the like basic tenants of international trade where, where you rely in the end that, that you're not in, in some incomparable, incomparably risky situation. And to have established maybe something more along those lines, more some sort of artificial intelligence insurance might have, in my view, perhaps fostered innovation more than the idea of some, some, some development space under the eye of the authority. Maybe it would have been perhaps simpler to say, you know, there, there are certain systems which if you register them somewhere and they pass some sort of certification, that then there are some sort of benefits if, if adhering to that. Instead of demanding people to come to you and disclose absolutely everything they're trying to innovate. So I really have doubts that that's going to fly much in practice. Anyway, another pillar of the UAI Act are the reporting, disclosure and monitoring or surveillance obligations and requirements, which, however, I do see in tension to privacy requirements and trade secrets even reaching as far as competition law. You have to disclose so much, which I shall go into a little bit later, um, that you really, you really wonder, like, like you, I would not feel very well disclosing all that much uh, if, if, uh, if in any way avoidable. So to fulfill these reporting obligations, which the EU AI Act is foreseeing, but also to be in compliance with even data privacy and, and competition law and so on and so forth, that's going to be, that's going to be a challenge in practice. I, I do see here space for legal friction, definitely. Moreover, the commission seems to be quite skeptic about manipulative practices and here deep fakes. The idea that you're seeing one person talking about something and it's not that person talking about that at all. <laughs> Frankly, I see actually much, much rather other <laughs> Uh, manipulative practices where you do not need to see a fake face. What is with the uh, ranking of search results? How about shop proposals? How about the arrangement of online shops? What, what products are shown first? What products are shown next? What, what is a recommendation? What, what algorithm is, is, is ranking things and, and people and, and results? There I see a much greater potential for manipulation rather than in, in having a fake voice or a fake image because it looks so innocuous you know like it's just just like text on a page arranged in some way it's this arrangement with which i believe you can manipulate people a lot more and that's not really an artificial intelligence topic that's a normal software topic which we have faced on many years you know that if you appear on page three or five of a certain of a certain search engine, you're virtually invisible. And next we are dealing with a couple of recitals here, which I have selected, which I'll just give you a general impression of where these things are going in general. So let's first perhaps look at recital 41. Um, its last sentence is quite interesting that there that this regulation shall shall not be a basis of data processing itself like specifically it says this regulation should not be understood as providing for the legal ground for processing of personal data including special categories of personal data where relevant now this stands a bit in tension with certain other provisions of the UAI Act, which which sort of do foresee such data processing. And I am curious how this is going to, to play out in practice. 
in particular, the GDPR would normally allow you to also undertake data processing based on legal requirements. And what this really does is telling you specifically that this shall not be seen as, as a legal requirement that would necessitate data processing. Maybe you can still go for legitimate interests or, which I find also very interesting, statistical processing. For, you see, under the GDPR's own basis, besides research, statistical purposes are also a legitimate ground on which to undertake um, data processing. And you could easily argue for many machine learning models and, and like approaches to be actually a sort of non-linear statistical function for projection or regression or like categorization of things. Because you, you get a couple of samples, you create some sort of function according to which function you would like to um, create some form of evaluation for further input. But you do that based on samples. So you could in some way maybe argue that this is a form of statistical processing. Only that it's not you know, linear regression or something. The next recital, which I have written here, 49, is also quite interesting because accuracy metrics shall be communicated to users. Now, I assume that what they really mean by precision or accuracy is the maybe the relation of correct to false positives and, and negatives. But that really depends on the use case. So if you are a provider of a sort of stencil system where multiple use cases can be established and that the real employment of the solution depends on the user, I find it a little bit hard to imagine how exactly you want to communicate accuracy metrics if you do not strictly decide the precise use case. So, so that, that is going to be a little bit challenging. And moreover, you could say that like adding extra complexity to this, if you try to avoid bias, in particular societal bias, which otherwise would be technically totally present in the data, then you might have to decrease accuracy. You understand? So the, the system does not make certain precise differentiations because those precise differentiations might exactly be a form of discrimination. So you might have to introduce technical bias of a sort in order to avoid societal bias. Recital 51 deals with cybersecurity, but as I mentioned already, cybersecurity here means something way broader than normally. Here, the commission also means data poisoning, adversarial attacks, etc., etc. That is misuse of the system, and that is way broader than for normal software. Because, for instance, when you are imagining cybersecurity in relation to a word processing program, then, then you would hardly imagine trying to prevent someone to write blackmail with that program or, or threats or something like that or offenses or whatever you want. So you, you would only imagine some, some well, um, escalation of privileges or something like that. But, but here the concept does also include data poisoning, adversarial attacks, and so on and so forth. That is, in fact, making, tricking the system into doing something it's not designed to do. And that is a way bigger um, issue with regard to your surveillance and limitation of users than what is commonly nowadays for normal software understood as cybersecurity. And then the recital 75 also mentions uh, the importance of testing and experimentation and facilities and laboratories which, which permit that. So these are again your funny um, regulatory sandboxes where, where you can test and experiment, but if you do one misstep, they can actually punish you. Yeah, and these two, these last two, I, I see just as like variants 
of, of the theme of control and, and surveillance, which is expressed also in recital 58, uh, relating to monitoring and uh, record keeping, and perhaps also expressed in recital 44, with regard to the strict requirements on data sets, which are also being established. And the monitoring aspect, of course, becomes way more relevant when you think about the cybersecurity requirement, which is not only technical, but also materially relating to the use of the system. Because you, you understand, like, if, if you have a monitoring responsibility which shall prevent a misuse of the system, well, then that requires a completely different interaction than, you know, like the, these classical Unix uh, rights management things or like with users and groups or access control lists and whatnot like th this is going deeper than that and with a re in relation to to mention recital 44 it is said that the uh, training validation and testing data sets should be sufficiently relevant what is sufficiently relevant representative and free of errors but here now the question is does the sufficiently relate also to to these other adjectives like is it sufficiently free of errors or is it only sufficiently relevant like how free of errors does it have to be is this a relative term or an absolute one i am inclined to believe it is a relative so it should be sufficiently free of errors too and complete in view of the intended purpose of the system which again becomes a little bit difficult if you're dealing with a stencil system which is user configurable for specific purposes because then actually you might allow the user to to choose the specific use of a system like imagine some sort of neural network where you only have to give examples in a certain format you know, like um, expected replies to given challenges. And, and then it will just automatically train it and, and try to apply that function. Then you might use this neural network for all sorts of things. And then it is really hard to say what is the in exact intended purpose of the system, right? That's like not even a very abstract concept when you think of it, because a lot of hardware manufacturers are already uh, implementing sort of accelerators for, for this and that. So you, you could argue that, that you, you are somewhere there a little bit in AI system territory. And then, I mean, looking at recital 41, where I told you um, uh, that there should be like, that this regulation should be no basis for data processing, then comes something strange because it's also said that in order to protect the rights of uh, of others from the discrimination that might result from the bias in AI systems, the providers should be able to process also special categories of personal data as a matter of substantial public interest in order to ensure the bias monitoring monitoring means continuous surveillance right detection and correction in relation to high-risk ai systems <laughs> i mean depending on how this is being lived this really could be a bit of a door to mass surveillance of any form of so-called high-risk ai systems and now looking again at perhaps some of the Central tenets of the EU AI Act, these would be, again, here, just like in the prior documents, a broad AI definition, a focus on high-risk systems, and extraterritoriality of the application of the rule set established herein. Perhaps it would be most useful to first look at the broad AI definition. Now, positively, one can remark that it is a functional definition. 
and you will really find more details about it in recital 6 as well as in article 3 and the idea is you're talking of a system which can generate outputs such as content whatever content really is predictions recommendations or decisions which influence the environment with which the system interacts i mean wow again what is not an ai <laughs> you know like like what system shall influence shall generate an output which influences nothing you wouldn't want such a system right so everything influences the environment with which the system interacts you see the term is neutral so these might be people or it might be other systems uh, well generating outputs such as means that the listing is only demonstrative so so that's not even um, an exhaustive list of what is generated content is really everything like that that that's the rest which is not predictions recommendations or decisions so in other words that's again an extremely broad definition and again, I see it missing actually the point because the question here is how the replacement of valuation and discretionary decisions, which normally humans are meeting, by valuations according to some algorithm will influence the human condition. Like, like that's the real question of the employment of artificial intelligence and not regulating um, while well, squeezing sort of everything under the EI term. Yeah. Now, this is relevant because once you're having an AI system and you realize you can have that rather quickly, the question really becomes whether you're dealing with a high-risk system. And high-risk systems really have three components with which, um, like, where, where you can end up there. The one is if you are in some way um, having a system which presents a, a risk to health or safety or fundamental rights. And, and, and there's the rub, you know. I mean, on the positive side, one may remark that having high-risk systems is not entirely forbidden. It is just regulated. But to see what can, can be understood as a fundamental right is really quite disconcerting because the concept is so very broad. You're having anything which can influence human dignity, freedom of expression and information, when you, when you think already about moderation of um, writings and online forums, you, you're deep in this territory. Non-discrimination, who may do what, right? Consumer protection, and you know that that already is quite a topic in and of itself. And, and it goes down to things like the right to good administration. Again, it raises the question, what are even the limits to the scope of the so-called fundamental rights? Plus, you, you need to mind the protection of personal data. And then you can, of course, raise the questions of the relation to the general data protection regulation. So, to sum this up so far... We're having a very broad definition of artificial intelligence, so all sorts of systems which you would not necessarily guess as being AI would actually fall under it. And you also have a very broad definition of what a high-risk system is, so there is a high risk, haha <laughs> pun intended, that the system you are looking at is a high-risk AI system. Because you can influence some of those very broadly defined fundamental rights. One might, one might be evil and ask which rights would not be fundamental, you know. And the final interesting element is, of course, extraterritoriality, because that can totally lead to conflicts of law. Like, just as the EU finds it very funny to, to create an act with extraterritorial effect, so may, in fact, China and 
did with their equivalent of the GDPR, um, impose a law which also has extraterritorial effect, like, haha, we can do that too. So that actually can, in my eyes, have the potential for market segmentation in the end, because you're having non-compliance. That is, uh, you cannot comply with two directly conflicting regulations. So the only thing you can really do is keep away from the one territory uh, where, where you're non-compliant and just choose to comply only with one legal um, set of requirements. So, so when that happens, you are in fact dividing the market and, and you know establishing in reality barriers to, to international trade. Like that is certainly GDPR inspired, which which also was totally having this like pioneering in a way, this this extraterritorial effect very very broadly. And the recitals 10 and 11 actually I see as quite pointing um, at such an inspiration by the GDPR. Also, a little bit of a dynamite uh, might be what even is the intended purpose of, of an AI system, which, which plays a role here and there, in particular regarding the level of testing and, and safety requirements and so on and so forth. When you regard stencil systems, like systems which, which are actually user adjustable in order to serve any particular purpose. Now, having had a look at that, we might next look at a couple of further noteworthy definitions, which you will find in Article 3. Now, besides the definition of the AI system, remarkable are also the definitions of pre provider, importer, distributor, and user which together are the operators of the AI system and potential addressees, indeed also actual addressees, of legal requirements. Moreover, note the extraterritoriality expression that the act applies on systems which you are making available on the European market, which is, by the way, also not the same thing as putting them into service. And you also have to take care of reasonably foreseeable misuse. Now, if you have such a responsibility, then that really leads to quite a few legal risks and, of course, a motivation for surveillance. Now, which coincidentally, of course, matches your post-market monitoring obligations, which you can also read about in this article. And we, of course, shall delve into them a little bit elsewhere, too. Further described are, in Article 5, certain prohibited practices, like stuff which your AI system may not do at all. And in that regard, what is prohibited are subliminal techniques distorting behavior likely causing harm. <laughs> if, you, if you're very strict, you could see that in, you know, digital makeup or a photo filter. Because in reality, you could say that this is a subliminal technique distorting your perception of um, aesthetics, whether that be of products or persons. And yes, likely causing harm because you might just order a product which you otherwise wouldn't have ordered. And you see how quickly this gets into an area which likely isn't the main target of, of the regulation, but would, according to the text, perchance really fall there under. You're also not allowed to be exploiting vulnerabilities and causing physical 
or psychological harm. The psychological harm requirement is actually quite interesting because here you are a little bit in an area of potentially Im immaterial damages and liability, like some, some similar regime perhaps as that which has been suggested under the GDPR for um, unlawful data processing. Prohibited are also state-imposed social scoring systems. Now, this criteria of such systems being state-imposed is rather interesting. <laughs> Can you roll out a private one? I mean, that, that's a very good question, right? Because, because you could say that you're perhaps automatically exploiting vulnerabilities when you do that, but it is a separate point, so <laughs> maybe, right? I mean, of course, this is directed against the Chinese social scoring systems, but it should not be forgotten that this Chinese system did not just arise out of nowhere. In reality, the Chinese just copied similar systems already existing in the West for credit scores and so on and so forth. It only is so that, um, so to say, in the view of the Chinese state, your financial standing is perhaps not as important as your general attitude to their party and um, social system. So, to prohibit the social scoring system of, of, of state-imposed nature is perhaps closing your eyes before the reality that such scoring systems do and have existed for a long time in the West, only they were not state imposed, but just generally practically effective. You could say that without a good credit score, you wouldn't be really able to finance housing and things like that. So we would be a little bit making ourselves illusions if we say, oh my God, they have such a bad social scoring system. Well, we would never allow such a thing. In reality, we have all sorts of social scoring systems, just most of them in a private nature, which by no means makes that a good thing. I just mean prohibiting state-imposed ones while tolerating the private ones <laughs> is a weird approach in a way. But then again, you know, you want to have some form of source, some form of evaluation of, in reality, unknown parties. So you know, you, you, you just maybe need some form of scoring system in order to facilitate relations in, in, in an economic sense. And really funny, I find, a remote biometric identification is, is like generally not allowed. Now, we're not talking about some law enforcement um, situation, but, but just like like a general other situation. First of all, it must be, of course, remote biometric identification, right? Because otherwise your face or your fingerprint could no longer open your phone, right? Because that's a form of biometric ident identification. So for crime prevention and prosecution, that is allowed, but <laughs> um, otherwise the element of a remote is important because um, if it, if it wouldn't be there, then if, if you just forbid biometric identification, you would prohibit fingerprint scanners. <laughs> uh, that certainly would not be intended. But still, it has interesting other consequences. For instance, what is a remote biometric identification? Does the remoteness have to relate to the distance of the person and the observing sensor? That is a camera watching the street, for instance. Or would the remoteness perhaps also carry over to sensors which more immediately capture you, but um, but sort of in a, in a disconnected way from you process that in order to identify you and so on and so forth, which, which might have interesting consequences to all sorts of presently operating systems, such as, for instance, functionalities in social networks to realize whether two profiles of persons are the same. You know, some social networks have such a function that, that if you would upload your 
picture somewhere and and someone else creates a profile by copying your pictures you know just they see them in the network so save them and create a clone of your profile that you would be sort of alerted for that now that might be useful of course to combat um, misuse of your information to combat the creation of illegitimate clones of your profile <laughs> but for that of course you would need to biometrically identify a person you would need to somehow say hey wait a minute these two profiles really are the same person <laughs> would that be permitted or if you look at let's say um other sites like like some some health related ones which are telling whether for instance you you might be having this or that mm, illness or propensity to 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 something or or perhaps even your attractiveness score on, on other like on dating sites or something that they say you know like if you're a cyclope maybe maybe you're less attractive for that so this this prohibition of remote biometric identification i wonder what effects that will really have in practice because evidently the the purpose is to to stop systems from simply um, establishing network of um, national surveillance you know like somebody sets up a couple of cameras and and films everybody who's on the street and identifies all the people there and then creates movement profiles of who has been where when and so like evidently that's not desired uh, that i understand but the quite open way this has been worded leaves of course room for interpretation for certain purposes which otherwise might be actually legitimate right so yeah here you have them the remote biometric identification i just mentioned and now we can also mention the definition of high risk systems and there are really three things which can make a system to be classified as high risk it could be a system listed in the catalog in Annex 3. These are systems which are definitely high risk systems. There are certain also quite broad definitions. And moreover, Annex 3 is not actually frozen because as per Article 7, uh, the, the Commission may update the contents of Annex 3. So, the qualification of what a high risk system is may change like spontaneously sort of you you don't need who knows what legislation to do so also uh, ai systems which are part of safety components are considered automatically high risk systems now that one's actually quite interesting because there is no materiality requirement like it's not actually necessary for the AI system to be an important part of a safety component or a part materially influencing the functioning of a safety component. It just is part of a safety component in perhaps its most irrelevant one, but thereby automatically becomes a high risk AI system. And systems which present a risk to harm fundamental rights are also considered high risk but given how broad fundamental rights are interpreted and given that consumer protection apparently triggers uh, fundamental right um, risks the the risk to harm fundamental rights is, is really a broad one like you, you you can really quickly get there in fact i do expect some form of limit interpretation of this in practice because you of course don't want to have all sorts of systems as being currently classified as high risk that, that would really bring about a rather high regulatory burden and and certainly not be very helpful for for making a lot of ai solutions popular now as i mentioned High-risk systems have to be also surveilled throughout their useful life. And unsurprisingly, Article 9 
addresses the risk management system for high risk artificial intelligence. And part of that is that risk management for high risk AI is an iterative process run throughout the entire life cycle of a high risk artificial intelligence system requiring regular systematic updating. Well, that raises a lot of legal questions in my eyes. I mean, for instance, is there a duty to update? And here, is there a duty to update for the provider? And is there a duty to update for the user? <laughs> because you could say that maybe one or the other user would like to, to use a system with certain properties, but that of course would mean that he cannot update it, right? So there's clearly a strong surveillance element implied here. And it also raises questions regarding the type of contract you're dealing with. Because in a normal sale and purchase contract, for instance, you are just having a point in time obligation to be fulfilled. Like here's the system, there's the money. And, and both parties exchange that and, and then they wave each other farewell and that's it. But an updating duty really speaks for a continuous obligation. And the continuous obligation fits simply service contracts way better than point in time contracts. And indeed, what is the interpretation of this duty to update? Can, for instance, updates be subject to separate contracting where if you do not conclude this additional contact contract, you do not get updates or you do not get them as long and so on and so forth. Like such contracts are very usual for software normally. But here the question is like, do they need just to be offered or do they need to be uh, implied in the original price? Like, like how is this, this systematic, regular systematic updating to be understood? Going along the lines of asking ourselves what happens regarding like the contract type, an interesting question of course may arise also what happens uh, with regard to the application to open source systems. See the thing is that there is no exception for open source systems. So actually these rules might just as well I would support that actually, according to their text, apply also to open source high risk AI solutions. And given how quickly you might get into having your system judged as artificially intelligent and how quickly it might be seen as somehow uh, being, being dangerous to so-called fundamental rights, which go down to proper administration, you might really quickly have open source systems ending up as being judged as high risk AI systems. I don't really see anyone really taking that up uh, to, to fulfill all of these legal obligations. Well, you also have further risks arising from the requirement to plan for re reasonably foreseeable misuse. I mean, I mean, you know, you, you prohibit the user from doing certain things and then what things might the user nevertheless do. So, so you're making a sort of clownish comedy out of the uh, rules you set up for the use of the system. You say, what could the user nevertheless go, do wrong? And there you are shifting strangely the responsibility for the proper use of the system from the one party to the other. That is, if you say my system is only to be used for the categorization of the size of frogs, and then, and then another person is using that for, for the categorization of, of one's classmates, <laughs> then, then suddenly you have to, to plan for, for all sorts of things which just might happen. Also, there is a presumption that there is an imbalance of power between the parties and that somehow the user is the less powerful party here. That ignores that in, in, in real economic relationships, there may be actually 
um, a business to business relationship where, for instance, the user is the real expert in that field or the really powerful entity, which is just simply ordering some certain AI system to be developed elsewhere. So this, this whole talk about the imbalance of power arises some presumptions which lack certainly some form of justification, like, like it, it may be sometimes so, but sometimes it really may be the reverse. It depends on the type of contract between the parties. So therein I see a certain legal indetermination and risks arising therefrom. However, there is also an easement, namely testing should only be done according to the system's purpose. I mean, the relation between the system's purpose and the reasonably foreseeable misuse is exactly one of those things which remain to be seen in practice. Because you could otherwise, of course, foresee the purpose of the system very narrowly, even though it offers facilities to do more, more broad things, like broader things with it. And then the question really is, even if you could reduce your testing obligation according to to narrowing down the purpose, doesn't it again get widened by the factual possibility of doing other things with it? So in short, the risk management requirement imposes numerous risk management duties and the type of measures you have to take may differ according to past system behavior, like was it reliable or did it misbehave somehow significantly, impact degree, plurality of persons, as well as reversibility of the effects, like, like are many people affected, can, can you make it good again, and things like that. You could see, perchance, Article 10, which deals with data and data governance, a little bit as a sort of expression of um, proper data preparation and risk management in the field of, of data and data governance. So the first and foremost idea here is to prevent biases from expressing themselves in the data and, and in the end permeating the system and influencing its behavior. Because if the system is relying on data as examples in order to draw conclusions, then the idea here evidently is that biased data may lead to biased conclusions and biased functionality of the system as a whole. And so here in Article 10, perhaps most relevant is really Cipher 3 that training, validation, and testing data sets shall be relevant, representative, free of errors, and complete, and that they shall have the appropriate statistical properties. Well, <laughs> there are a lot of legal questions, of course, arising here. For instance, to what degree and according to what measure can you say that these things are fulfilled with regard to relevancy or representativeness or freedom of errors? I mean, evidently, if you are dealing with large data sets, expecting every single datum inside to be correct is delusional <laughs> and would make the development of systems really impossible. So there must be some form of degree, in my view, according to which these properties are fulfilled. But again, it is difficult to, to, make, um, to make certain the criteria according to, to which to measure that. For instance, completeness. Well, you could arguably say that for real world applications, you will never have a complete data set. You will only always have some form of, of examples according to which to judge the immeasurable ocean of the real world. Like you will never have all cases. If you have a system to classify ducks, you will never be able to make a photo of every duck in the world. So, so the completeness requirement is, is something which is a little bit stunning. It could be complete enough in order to fulfill the aim, but then the question is what's then the relation to the statistical properties, which by the way are also not exactly outlined. And, and why statistical properties? Why not logical properties? Or 
may, and what, what is meant by statistical properties? Is it the degree of fulfillment of the system? Like how many ducks are correctly categorized or something like that? So that's just, again, a listing of a lot of requirements whose material content exactly is truly hard to determine because these are really indeterminate legal um, terms. Not to mention, this is all not really suitable for evolving artificially intelligent systems. Like if you have a system where you're having labeled data, you know, you have a data set and you know to what sort of inputs, what sort of outputs are expected and -da 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 -da, you let the system like just, just build up neural weights according to that. That's fine, that would be nicely handled here. But what happens if you're having an evolving system? That system doesn't strictly have a data set. It has um, some form of sensoric perception of, of its interactions with the outer world, for instance, or some form of user. And from these interactions, it incrementally adjusts its own functionality. But there isn't actually any data set training that in the most classical sense of the world word it's it's like data is permanently acquired evaluated and used for adjustments that's not a data set it's more like a data stream but even sticking with um well systems trained on labeled data you may run into interesting questions in particular with regard to the gdpr because for this bias examination and bias monitoring, you of course need to, to, to do this in, in a legally proper way. And here, it is in fact foreseen that for bias monitor, monitoring, special categories of data according to the GDPR shall be permitted to be processed. But really the details of that are still not all that much recounted. In other words, you're still then maybe in dangerous waters because you are, you, you, you have the obligation to prevent biases, but on the other hand, you must not process these perhaps special categories of data in, in manners which would not suit the GDPR. So you might have here a legal basis to do that, but the way of doing it is itself having certain requirements which might be hard to fulfill. And so this bias examination and monitoring might in practice be something quite challenging to fulfill. After all, if you're, for instance, processing whether a certain um, group of people belong to a certain race or not, there may be certain requirements on how such processing may be even undertaken because certainly that's not some form of evaluation which, um, which, which would happen with usual security requirements. Like you should certainly take proper measures of doing this, you know, in the right way, like with, with proper security approaches and so on and so forth. So that may actually drive you to have to undertake certain data processing, which, <laughs> which many companies might rather want to avoid, you know. But bias prevention is a part of your duty. You, you can't have a high-risk AI system where, where you're not taking care of that. Now, just as there were requirements regarding the risk management for high-risk AI systems, there are also requirements regarding the technical documentation. And here Article 11 is sort of relevant, but mostly it just serves as a pointer to Annex 4, which has the real requirements. And so you must, inter alia, um, determine the purpose of the system. The system requirements regarding hardware and software which might become quite a challenge given that you know these things of course also develop then you should also provide installation instructions and you shall provide the descriptions of all forms in which the ai system is placed on the market or put into service i mean what does that actually mean but that's actually still not yet the most important point 
for that really is the detailed description of the AI. And boy, do they want to have it detailed. <laughs> so, uh, now, first of all, this detailed description is not static. It's something which you will have to keep up to date. You'll have to state the purpose of the system, its algorithms and logic, uh, the design choices which you have made, development methods and steps, system architecture oversight, validation and testing, monitoring and surveillance, detailed description of the risk management system, evaluation performance in a post-market phase, that is when you look into the system when it is already in the sphere of the users, a list of standards adhered to, and a description of any change made to the system throughout its life cycle. I mean, what does that mean? Is this every commit? And how does that relate to evolving systems? So that doesn't really, doesn't really fit ongoing system development, nor really self-evolving systems. So one might really ask, where is the risk-based approach now? Like, not even the GDPR goes to such bureaucratic lengths anywhere. Like, even regarding systems to which you make a data processing impact assessment. And as if <laughs> that long list of, of um, technical documentation requirements wasn't quite enough, you also have record keeping or logging requirements for high-risk artificial intelligence systems. Now, the aim of the logging requirement is a level of traceability of the AI systems functioning throughout its life cycle and that must be appropriate to the intended purpose. Again, this is, this is weird because not always will the provider of the system define the intended purpose. But it is, in fact, predominantly the user who gets a system in order to do something. It's the user who really knows what the purpose will be for which he gets the system. And what is really... To be noted here is that there is a lot of information requirements, but their specific content is not particularly clear. And again, we're having this assumption that the users are non-experts, non that, that somehow they know less about artificial intelligence than the provider, which again, in a business-to-business -business situation might not at all be true. What is anyway notable here is a sort of fear of substantial modification and therefore the establishment of a necessity of post-market monitoring. And again, one may ask how to interpret by way of contract types this sort of continuous obligation which, which is thereby imposed for high-risk AI systems. So not only the user has to, to be paying attention to his system, but the provider has to pay attention to a system which he has once upon a time sold to a user. I mean, for, for some jurisdictions, that will be a really weird and novel way to interpret what is by nature a sort of point contract, like point in time contract, where you just give a system, get the money, and, and, and you know, you should be free. But here, in fact, you have a uh, record keeping obligation. This all, by the way, is also to be understood in conjunction with Article 13, which I should have mentioned as well. Now, the things you need to provide, that's quite a list. You need to provide the a reference database, huh, whatever that is, against which input data has been checked by the system. I mean, what are these? Case of a neural network, would these be the neural weights? Because there isn't much other database <laughs> contained in the system other than that. And what will you do with a matrix of neural weights? Like, that's 
perfectly pointless. However, that is not irrelevant because according to Article 29, this reference database against which input data has been checked might have to be used in a data processing impact assessment according to the GDPR. So you also have to clarify the system's performance as regards the person or persons on which the system is intended to be used. So, I mean, uh, like person or group of persons, right? Why on? So it's not for, it's on, as if they are experimental bunnies or something. This, this has in view a certain type of relationship which might just not quite fit the relationship in reality. And then you should also note any known or foreseeable, ah, a lot of legal risk in this word, circumstance which may lead to risks to the health and safety or fundamental rights, this totally wide circle of rights, which sort of can mean everything. And you are expected to, to note also the expected lifetime and necessary maintenance and updates to the system. I mean, this, this thing is sort of funny because uh, I mean, nobody publishes a system of which he expects that it will totally need updates. Like you try to publish something which, which you see as reasonably complete, right? And how binding is this expected lifetime? And what does that mean? So you give a system from A to B and you say the system is to be used for three years, but B uses it for five years. One of the consequences which we will see later on is that B thereby might become actually the new provider of the system because he is changing the purpose of the system. But, but that's quite a minefield to navigate. And, and I'm not sure that this is really really matching the present understanding of software systems. I mean, in reality, the idea, at least in the European Union, generally speaking, is once you buy it, it sort of is yours within the usage limitations. Just here, the usage limitations can become quite large. So to sum it up, you see again, lots of requirements but not of very clear nature. And that brings us now to the human oversight requirement. And here the aim is to enable effective oversight. Again, we're having a multitude of non-specific requirements. And sometimes one might even think that they are a little bit removed from reality. The real idea here is to make it possible for the human to decide not to use the high risk AI system. And for that, there are also a multitude of not all that specific requirements. In particular, the idea is that the user should be able to intervene on the operation of the high risk AI system or interrupt the system through a stop button or similar procedure. And the evident question is, can the user even make a competent decision? Can the user return or restart the system as easily? Now, in my view, this reminds a little bit of um, scram systems for sudden shutdown of nuclear reactors. You know, you, you hit the button and the uranium rods are out and, and the chain reaction is interrupted and, and everybody's very safe. Well, the question here really is, is the average Joe or the average Stacy even qualified enough and competent to intervene? Will they be better off once they have stopped the system? And imagine that they do stop the system suddenly, but then decide that they do need it again. Can they equally quickly restart it? Because the requirement really is just to stop it. There is no requirement to be able to quickly restart it. And 
Let me give you here a little bit of examples from, from aircrafts, all right? So we all, of course, have read about the studies of that murderous autopilot, which could ram the jet into the ground because of whatever error it had inside. So it, it would, of course, be, be very necessary in such a situation when you realize, wait a minute, this thing is going to steer me into the ground, that you're able to turn this off, take the control over the aircraft and steer it to safety. So that certainly would be a positive outcome. But things can get more complex if you look at uh, computer-assisted flight, because nowadays some aircraft are so maneuverable here in particular in the, in the military segment that they cannot even fly without an artificially intelligent system constantly adjusting their flight characteristics like thousands of times a second sometimes in order to 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 provide for a stable flight like basically these aircraft are highly unstable and the human could not adjust that but a machine can and by allowing such adjustments by machine multiple times a second, you can have more maneuverable aircraft. Like if you would have to take away these instabilities, you would also take away some, some of the maneuverability. But if a computer controlling um, the, the aircraft surfaces um, is turned off, you might actually have an aircraft which is unpilotable. So turning off the high risk um, system there might actually result um, in, in a crash, right? Because this thing will immediately enter some uncontrollable condition which, which a human cannot fix. And you do need absolutely the computer to fix it because otherwise it can't fly. So the situation is not as simple as it looks because there might be systems which so much depend on the interaction of a high risk AI system that you can't safely turn that off at all. And the next, next article, article 15, is dealing with accuracy, robustness, and cybersecurity, whereby we do not exactly know what some of these terms mean. And, and another term of which we think we know what it means may mean here really something quite different. So what exactly shall be the measures of accuracy and robustness is, is not 100% clear, but cybersecurity as mentioned already multiple times, is not what you normally understand on the cyber security. It, it also relates to, to tricking the system into unforeseen or disallowed behavior. However, here is a little bit of an easement that a risk-based approach is uh, to be followed. That is, you have to find appropriate levels and resilience in light of the intended purpose and, and circumstances and risks of the system. Of course, here one has to think also of the likely or possibly foreseeable, like likely foreseeable misuses of the system. So you, you maybe cannot entirely rely on a completely clean use of the system. But perchance one way of approaching it is um, uh, perhaps certain carryover of principles and standards established in connection to the GDPR. You know, like you also had to have their security of data processing. So maybe some security of artificial intelligence processing might be modeled according to that. An interesting question, of course, arises with regard to configurations with third party components over which you have only limited control, right? And what are indeed appropriate mitigation measures against bias? And what is even the mitigation that will also be left to the interpretation of the authorities in practice? Because really mitigating bias means adjusting the system. And that means you recognize that bias, exercise some form of counter bias and try to thereby fix it but how that exactly shall work and, and to what degree you're allowed to skew data because that's what you're really doing. To combat society uh, perce perceptible bias, you need to skew technically data. That, that will be interesting to see. And, and of course, the question is, what, what do you do with regard to evolving systems, which are clearly captured by 
by the regulation, but they are way harder to protect against skewing of their functionality by the users. Because, you know, that's the whole point of an evolving system. It shall adjust its functionality. Now, if the principles of adjustment of its functionality are clear, and they should be made clear because after all, you're supposed to explain the functioning of your system, then the user has, of course, every means of, of tweaking this and, and, and perhaps finding some twisted manner of operation of the system, which is going contrary to all lofty ideas regarding bias and robustness and accuracy and whatnot. Like if, if you give me a system which is classifying birds as ducks, or non-ducks, right? But the system is open and evolving and I can show further examples of ducks, then nothing really prevents me from showing it cats and telling it these are ducks. And then it will be categorizing both cats and ducks as ducks. So uh, <laughs> I do wonder how these, these nice principles and requirements are to be fulfilled with regard to evolving systems. So the robustness against faults and inconsistencies and resilience against um, well, such perhaps user exploits, uh, that, that will be quite a challenge, I believe, because these, uh, the, these requirements are material requirements reaching into the content in the system and not just some formal requirements as cybersecurity, for instance, typically foresees. But enough of that, let's go further to the obligations of providers and users of high-risk AI systems. And these you can find in articles 16 and forth following. Regarding the general duties of providers, in Teralia you can find quality management, technical documentation, and conformity assessment of the system and the system's registration. Moreover, they have to take the necessary corrective actions if, if they see malfunction or misuse of the system and inform the authorities of non-compliance as well as demonstrate to authorities compliance upon these authorities' a request <laughs> that certainly has very charming elements of Mars surveillance right there. Like, hey, wait a moment, I sold the system to so-and-so and now I detect that the system is not being used according to its original purpose. Dear authority, I would like to report that, right? So, so that makes really the, the relationship between parties a little bit complex because the one is surveilling the other. And the question also is how can these, these three last points be fulfilled by parties which are not the actual original creators of the system? Because the definition of a provider is, is such that the provider may change. I'll later talk a little bit more about that, but where an importer into the EU cannot be identified, for instance, then, then just an authorized representative has to assume the duties of the provider. And, and I'm not always sure that this will be quite possible for, for such entities to fulfill. Like they might find themselves in interesting situations. Now, in the same spirit, we continue in regard to Article 17, which I find to be one of those strange articles, because it is explicitly said that the requirements stated therein shall be proportionate to the size of the provider's organization. Really, wouldn't it be more fitting for the requirements to be suiting the system they should be applying towards. I mean, if a small company creates a very, very risky system, should that be somehow 
in an easier position than a large company, which creates something which just formally falls into the high risk category, but isn't really materially all that risky. So I find there a bit of a contradiction in the underlying valuation. But anyway, you have to demonstrate there and, and like establish and demonstrate a strategy for regulatory compliance. Uh, part of your quality management system also has to concern itself with the design techniques, technical specifications, validation procedures, risk management, data management, and communication with authorities. Whereby data management uh, also relates to the collection and labeling and aggregation and retention of data. Again, labeling, yeah, that's not necessarily how the system is working because evolutionary systems might be operating without labeling data and just trying to find natural subdivisions within the data without any person actually labeling the categories. So to say, find categories by your own means and don't rely on human supplied categorization through labels. And then we're having a whole swath of other art articles with, yeah, well, pointing in the same direction, such as article 18 relating to technical documentation, 19 to conformity assessments, 20 to log keeping with particular requirements for banks like financial institutions throughout the EU AI Act are facing extra regulation because you know they haven't had enough. But of course, the point is that already in the 1980s when this whole when when this whole AI business was just starting to take off, there was an inexplicable stock exchange crash in the United States where, where it could not exactly be explained why, why it happened exactly. But one of the theories is that there weren't all that many stock exchange trading programs at the time and that the banks were using substantially similar software. So when the software started to adjust itself to market conditions, all the softwares of all the banks started to adjust themselves in sort of the same way creating a, a sort of mini crash. So I understand why there are <laughs> uh, specific requirements for banks there. Anyway, so where was I? Yeah, corrective action or recall. Now that's interesting, of course. So if you cannot correct the, the system's functionality, then you have to recall the system. I mean, what does a recall really mean? It, 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 it can bankrupt the provider of the system, right? So that, that's not a harmless thing. And then you are having a, a certain duty to inform in case of risks at the national level. And in such, a, in such cases, the supervisory authority can demand that. And then the system can be withdrawn and all other necessary measures can can be taken, like are to be taken. So that might bankrupt you too. You of course have a duty to cooperate with authorities pursuant to article 23. And there are also certain obligations of product manufacturers who integrate high risk AI systems in, in certain other uh, as components in certain other systems. Well, essentially the manufacturer of such um, other systems has the same duties as the provider, but what is not 100% clear here is whether the original provider of the AI system is liberated from its responsibilities or whether they both become providers. It, it more looks like the second one to me. So that like if you have some sort of um, product into which you integrate an, a high risk AI system, then the producer of the product who integrates the high risk AI system is treated here clearly as a provider, but the original provider likely is not released either. And, and, and here it may be a little bit of a question of, of who 
of who evaluates what in what way, because they shouldn't be having a different view on sort of the same AI system. Then again, it also might be that that only the the use in a particular product makes a specific AI system high risk. And then you will have only the product manufacturer as provider of a high risk AI system. And for instance, just the, the software developer who creates that program might be just creating a sort of low risk stencil system, which, which needs further adjustment by the user. And in that case, it might be that the developer of the so-called stencil system here doesn't even have all of these documentation, quality management, and so on and so forth obligations, which a provider of a high-risk AI system would have, and just the product manufacturer would be having them. But then how shall the product manufacturer... Um, explain things like data selection, like design choices of the system and so on and so forth. This might be utterly intransparent to the product manufacturer. So this is what I meant with the danger of establishing certain duties for the provider of an AI system when the persona of the provider can change. And the new persona might just not have that information which is required uh, for the operation of a high-risk AI system. And here, yeah, regarding the conformity assessment, of course, uh, <laughs> providers of um, high-risk AI systems shall ensure that their systems undergo the relevant conformity uh, assessment procedure prior to placing them on the market or putting them into service. Again, the question being, who is the provider? And as we now spoke about the uh, obligations of the providers and users of a uh, high-risk AI system, let's next discuss the obligations of importers and distributors. Now, the importers and distributors are uh, responsible to ensure conformity of the high-risk AI systems and to provide all necessary information and documentation, which you can really see as quasi-statutory supervision agendas with particularly with partially overlapping duties with other parties, in particular with the provider, right? Because the provider also has to take care of the conformity. So there you're having a potential for extra bureaucracy and um, contradictions even. And the main issue here is that private entities are tasked with, with certain obligations which they can in reality only fulfill through certificates or anything similar because they might not even be all that acquainted with all the technical details which, which a real system developer knows, right? So it's unclear whether they would have even the necessary expertise to provide any information beyond that what they themselves get from the provider. Like I would regard it as highly doubtful. I would say that Whatever the provider tells them is all that they can possibly know. But because they have separate duties, you can sort of expect here more intercompany bureaucracy, as you certainly have already seen it with regard to security, data protection, and compliance. You know how companies send each other questionnaires and confirm me this and confirm me that. Yeah, yeah, well, here you will have to confirm a lot, a whole lot more. And that and particularly also because part of the duties are overlapping between various parties. In that regard, real fun is the next one, Article 28, the dynamic provider change. <laughs> so if you provide a system under your own name, right, you, you let someone develop a system for you. Or, oh, I love that one in particular, you modify the system's intended purpose. So the purpose, not the system. Or you substantially modify the high-risk KI system. Then you become the new provider. Notice how 
the substantial modification is the substantiality of the modification is only required for the system, not for the purpose. So that leaves us with a good question whether the purpose may be um, like whether any modification of the purpose leads to a change of the provider or only a substantial one. <laughs> I mean, this is evidently modeled according to the GDPR and the change of a data processor to a data controller if the processor decides to use the data in a different fashion than foreseen by the controller. However, a little bit also perhaps like in the GDPR, you of course have to ask yourself, how are these supposed, these new providers, which, which could be distributors, or importers or users, which become the providers in these situations, how these new providers can fulfill the documentation requirements. I mean, there are essentially two ways of that happening. The one is that they, like let's say the user has changed now the purpose of the system and has become the new provider, <laughs> perhaps even unconsciously so, perhaps he didn't even you know, no, uh, diligently enough read the documentation and is now the using the system somewhat differently. There is no explicit substantiality requirement. <laughs> and now he's the new provider. So does he have to fulfill provider obligations from this moment onwards? Or is he required to fulfill the provider obligations from the very beginning? That is, does the user in such a case have to explain design choices or data collection steps and criteria or accuracy measures and so on and so forth about that system? And, and for what period of time, like its entire lifetime or only from when on he changed the purpose? So you see, this is what I meant with dynamic provider changes being problematic in light of pretty static obligations which are quite calibrated to the developers of the system really and not to someone who may become a provider later on. So <laughs> I really wonder how, how this is going to be interpreted in practice because I mean, such a provider change, if you become a provider due to Article 28, I really ask myself, how do you escape liability? How do you escape being, being punishable under this regulation? Because you can't fulfill like 90% uh, like, like of the requirements because you just lack the information. And of course, it also raises questions regarding the original provider. I mean... <laughs> Um, if, if, if the system is only used by one user, you know, like you have made one high risk AI system, you're the provider and you have one user and that user changes the purpose of the system, <laughs> then, then are you still a provider? Like, you know, are you released from, from what obligations as provider are you released? Because evidently now, from now on, the the new user is the, like, your user is now the new provider of the system, like sort of to himself. But, but, but do you have to fulfill the documentation requirements, the log keeping, like till when, for how long, and so on and so forth? Or are these duties all, all transferred to the new provider? Or are they remaining for the previous period until the provider change with you? Also, for the user which may change the purpose of the system. This really creates heavy legal risks because the, in case of any dispute, the provider would really need to just show any change of purpose of the system by the user and, and sort of walks free then because then the original provider can say, look, the user has become the new provider because he changed the, the foreseen purpose of the system like by a millimeter. And now comes something also quite funny, namely obligations of the users of high risk AI systems. These were sort of foreshadowed already, but they have to use the systems 
as per the instructions. They have to monitor their operation, the human oversight element, and they have to keep logs, but we don't see for how long. <laughs> we don't know exactly, like, is, is it perhaps some, some term analogous to bookkeeping or, or tax requirements, or, or maybe one should draw an analog to, to the 10 year term foreseen for providers in article 50. We don't know, like providers have a 10 year term for which they are supposed to keep the, the, the logs, but, but for the users, it's not exactly stated clearly. So whether this is intended or not, I believe that this will <laughs> decrease the idea of the human oversight. Because if you have to use a system according to its instructions, then deciding to press that stop button and deciding to not use that system may put you in a situation of tension to the use instructions, right? And, and, and to the idea that you have to monitor the operation of the system and so on and so forth. You might feel that in order to fulfill the legal obligation of use according to instructions, you just don't want to touch the system all that much. And, well, I'm not sure that that quite corresponds to the general intention of, of the AI Act. And for banks, again, we have here special rules that if they fulfill certain internal governance arrangements, it is assumed that they fulfill, of course, these um, obligations as users. Now I'll be skipping a little bit on um, de certain details regarding conformity assessment bodies. And we shall go straight to articles 40 and following regarding harmonized standards and conformity assessment certificates for higher risk AI systems. In essence, con CE conformity markings shall be affixed to the system. And upon a request by authorities, you have to provide proof that conformity indeed exists. And you'll have to, you'll have to check conformity throughout the lifetime of the system. That's not a one-time exercise. And, and here the waters become a little bit murky because if the system is substantially modified, then the conformity assessment must be repeated. Okay, but what happens if the standards have changed? And here one might say that one must conform, of course, also to these new standards. For instance, if you look at security, you can say that, uh, I don't know, <laughs> uh, up to six letters, capital letters, was a sort of acceptable password choice in the 1970s, but wouldn't quite suffice nowadays security requirements. So if you say that your system is reasonably secure, that you can no longer say that, if, if, for instance, you, you have not conformed to some very necessary newer set of guidelines. So if the requirements really change, then you can only define your conformity to them if you make another assessment, even without you changing the system for that. It's just an outside change which may cause your system to be incompliant. And if this looks <laughs> already too complex, it, it gets one level up because you see the conformity assessment is something which typically is done by the provider, right? However, that is different from the mentioned data protection impact assessment, which is typically done by the user. And there are different parties possessing different information, in each case potentially relevant towards each other, which might need to be exchanged in order to make uh, the fulfillment of, of 
their respective duties even possible. That is, the users might need certain information from the providers in order to conduct data protection impact assessment uh, regarding the use of a certain high-risk AI system. But conversely, it is also imaginable that providers might need information from users as to how like what the challenges are which are met with such types of systems in practice because you might need to to assess certain elements regarding the requirements according to which the system must operate and now finally higher risk ai systems are basically required to be registered into an eu database pursuant to articles uh, 51 and 60 and this really reminds me, as I mentioned initially, of the of similar requirements in, in the field of data protection from pre-GDPR times, where data processing systems had to be registered at a national level in, in many countries in a similar way. And now as a final topic on this slide, <laughs> or sheet of our... EU AI Act Grimoire. Let's address something involuntarily funny, namely transparency obligations and, and this fear of deep fakes which the which which is permeating this this um, entire EU AI Act and, and its preceding documents, in particular with regard to video filters and image manipulation that, that is interesting to consider. And at least literally, this is not necessarily a requirement only for high-risk AI systems. I mean, it is basically there is an intention to protect against deep fakes and, and, and to make clear to you that you are led to converse with an artificial intelligence systems. But the established rules sort of totally overshoot these aims. And in Cipher 3, for instance, in the first, the first paragraph says, users of AI systems that, uh, that generate or manipulate image audio or video content that appreciably, uh, appreciably resembles existing persons objects, places, or other entities or events and would falsely appear to a person to be authentic or truthful, deep, fake, shall disclose that the content has been artificially generated or manipulated. I mean, I love that because that would actually cover video filters. <laughs> and 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 all sorts of you know um, like photoshopping of uh, products and so on and so forth. You you would always have to write this is not what it's really looking like. Like this person actually has a lot more wrinkles than on this photo. <laughs> I really want to see. I want really want to see that happening. Like that's gonna be just great. That's like the death of digital makeup. You know. So I don't think that's what they intended to do but it is what is in my view covered by the wording as it is right now all right now enough fun <laughs> let us revisit the regulatory sandboxes which i mentioned initially Now, with regard to the regulatory sandboxes, the idea clearly is to establish technical innovation spaces where you can receive regulatory guidance and, well, where developers of AI systems can develop under the eyes of authorities new products and services, like as if you really want to innovate with authoritarian guidance. Uh, the thing is, as I mentioned in the beginning, you are not given any guarantee of any leniency should any mishap happen to you. Like you cannot formally get that. 
because it is simply not foreseen in the various legal acts which might apply, apply to your handling. So, so this advantage of guidance really is like and, and getting resources it really might be quite offset by the bureaucracy when you are developing under the eye of Sauron. <laughs> and, and in a time, you know, just my personal opinion, but in a time of flexible cloud resources, I'm not sure that I see any real advantages of such regulatory sandboxes. In fact, I see these advantages even further diminished because for just in, in insubstantial amounts of money, you can get all these resources of, of these regulatory sandboxes from, from a cloud provider <laughs> and just, you know, not live in fear of, of, of the slightest mishap. So, like, just, just to give you a couple of examples of, of, of the things you, you would have to face if you make use of such regulatory sandboxes. I mean, it is said that any personal data processed are not to be transmitted, transferred, or otherwise accessed by other parties, which is certainly hampering subcontracting, right? Or the later need of joint ventures. You Like you start developing something, then you realize, wait a minute, I'm too small. I should come together with someone else and you know jointly do things. Yeah, but it shouldn't be accessed by third parties. So whatever you had been there as person had been having there as personal data, you, you wouldn't be now able to share, for instance, according to uh, legitimate interests, at, at least not by the latter. Or any processing of personal data in the context of the sandbox do not lead to measures or decisions affecting the data subjects. Affecting. Yeah, well, but it's, it's not even said negatively affecting, affecting at all. I mean, if you take that too literally, you could even say that formally um, you could not even rehire a data subject who has performed exceptionally well, for instance, in some study, right, or, 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 or um, development step or something, because you would be using the, the data in order to affect that data subject somehow, even if positively, right? So, yeah, I mean, the AI regulatory sandboxes shall not affect the supervisory and corrective powers of the competent authorities. And it may even lead to suspension of, of your activities there. And, and now imagine the effect on your business if, if, if it just all gets suspended. Like, how long can you survive that? Or participants in the AI regulatory sandbox shall remain liable under applicable union and member states liability legislation for any harm inflicted on third parties as a result from the experimentation taking place in the sandbox. In other words, zero leniency, at least formally speaking. So the usefulness in practice, if you if you look at the sort of minefield you have to walk through in order to make reasonable use of these sandboxes, I, I see as uncertain, in particular if I compare it to cloud services. So whether that's really worth it, I really don't know. I'm skeptic. And now we get to a part of the EU AI Act, which I regard as truly problematic, namely the post-market monitoring and surveillance obligations based on a plan according to a template by the Commission. So a post-market monitoring plan that is. And basically providers shall establish and document a post-market monitoring system in a manner that is proportionate, now that's a real joke, but I'll come to that in a moment, to the nature of the artificial intelligence technologies and the risks of the high-risk AI system. The post-market monitoring system shall actively and systematically collect, document, and analyze 
relevant data provided by the users or or yeah the or is really horrible collected through other sources so not provided by the users but you collect it in any way on the performance of the high risk ai systems throughout their lifetime and allow the provider to evaluate the continuous compliance of AI systems with the requirements set out in Title Three, Chapter Two, whatever. I mean, if that's not mass <laughs> surveillance, I don't know what it is. So you, you shall, and, and further, the market surveillance authorities shall be granted full access to the training, validation, and testing data sets used by the provider and where necessary to assess the conformity of the high-risk AI system with the requirements the, uh, the market surveillance authorities shall be granted access to the source code of the AI system. If we look at these requirements in detail, which are listed here in, in the article 61 and, and, and forth following as well as 64, well, basically uh, the, the user and the provider are completely nude, right? Also, it should be mentioned that article 62 sees a reporting duty of the provider to the authorities of any serious incident and any malfunctioning at all, essentially, yeah? So, I mean, the requirement of proportionality evidently <laughs> is the biggest joke of all, because this is like a fig leaf against the immediate accusation of disproportionality of such measures. And in my view, that really, this, 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 Articles 61 and following bear a great legal risk for the providers because if you do not if you do not surveil enough, then you're in breach of these requirements. But if you surveil too much, you might be in breach of a whole lot of other uh, laws, such as you know, GDPR in regard to data protection, but you have also all the pleasures of competition law corporate confidentiality affairs and whatnot. Not to mention what happens if the provider changes within the meaning of the law because for instance, the system's purpose changed or somebody else brought it under his own name in the market and so on and so forth. And, and also this, uh, this, this idea of, of data provided by users or collected through other sources that's just great. Uh, that that means in the end that that maybe you're supposed to establish alternative sur surveillance venues than those which the user is letting you have, right? So I, I clearly see here a pedal of, of potential mass mass surveillance, and in particular with this reporting duty to the authorities of any serious incident and any malfunctioning. I mean, wow, <laughs> you, you really have to spy on your customers in a way as a provider. Uh, I, I, don't see, I don't see how that is going to greatly help innovation in that sphere, quite frankly. <laughs> like as a user, I would be sort of afraid to get such a system. And the provision of the source code, of course, coupled to these first requirements is, is also quite remarkable because then you know, imagine any leak of the source code, then, then you know how to access these users of these systems and they are high risk AI systems. You know, if, if, if the source code is leaked and you find any weakness in it whatsoever, like, like out there in the wild, you're presenting third parties with a direct access to the user's systems. Okay, like, like if you think that's a very great idea, I, I don't think it's a good idea at all. And this, this, this thing, this requirement that where necessary to assess the conformity of the high-risk AI system, you have to present the source code to the authorities, you know, they always can require that. And, and that is related to Turing's halting problem. You know, Alan Turing was once upon a time in the, like, I think, 50s asked, 
like like when can you how can you determine how long a program will be running this this was really interesting at the time because of all these um, expensive computer time considerations and so on and so forth and Turing essentially replied you can't because if you press a button and and let's say a dial shows one and then you press the button again and it shows two and then you press it again and it shows three and then you press it again and it shows 437 you, you cannot foresee such weird behavior because it may be just entrenched in the program logic so whatever you prove about a system you can never prove the system's behavior completely unless you show the source code. From the outside, it's impossible to fully assess a system. And for that reason, uh, where necessary to assess the conformity, that thing can never be proven without access to the source code. So the authority can, in essence, always demand you to deliver the source code. That, that's what it really means. That coupled with the duty to provide the training, validation and testing data sets really means to deliver your business, you know. So, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure how they imagine to attract innovation with such measures, given in particular how quickly you can get into that area of having an AI system, not to mention having a high risk AI system. So now, if you thought that was that was pretty bad, let's get into a <laughs> sort of, I mean, in my personal view, even more absurd place of the proposed EU AI Act, namely compliant AI systems, which present a risk. And in such cases, the Commission foresees the possibility to demand withdrawal from the EU market of the said system and recall of the system if, if nothing else is possible, which can bankrupt the company, evidently. And I find that absurd. I find that Corleone style, you know, <laughs> because you are compliant. That's the whole point. How can you require that? of a compliant system. Like Article 68 does have uh, a restriction, a recall and withdrawal requirements if the system is not compliant with the requirements. That far I understand. But, but in case of non formal non-compliance, that's one thing. If you are formally compliant, how can you still be demanded to, to uh, bear such economic hardship just because a risk has been determined. I mean, this I see as really wanton. Like, I, I find that terrible. From my view, this is, this is the most absurd article of this regulation. And then we're having, yeah, in detail, the following description. Where, having performed an evaluation under Article 65, the Market Surveillance Authority of a member state finds that, although an AI system is in compliance with this regulation, it presents a risk to the health and safety of persons to the compliance of obligations under union or national law intended to protect fundamental rights, which might even be just consumer protection, or to other aspects of public interest protection, just a risk, like it doesn't really breach anything. It shall require the relevant operator to take all appropriate measures to ensure that the AI system concerned when placed on the market or put into service no longer presents that risk to withdraw the AI system from the market or to recall it within a reasonable period, commensurate with the nature of the risk as it may prescribe. I mean, in reality, that's like a zero risk requirement because the point is compliance, in my view, is exactly then established when you have proper risk management, when you have undertaken proper quality assurance and so on and so forth. And, and when your conformity statement is correct, then, then you are compliant. 
how can you be compliant? How can you have done all of these things and they still determine a risk and they still send you to hell? Anyway, um, I find that most annoying. So then we may as well progress to codes of conduct. Now that's a little bit of a, of a positive thing perhaps. Namely, codes of conduct, according to which you can like demonstrate compliance with this and that, can be drawn up by organizations of providers or by individual providers. And the same applies also to users. And that might even be the case for single systems. So it's apparently not all too hard to draw up a code of conduct which which would be helping you to demonstrate compliance with the requirements of the regulation. And the idea is really to define objectives and key performance indicators of, of the system. And then, you know, like I will be omitting in the end a couple of administrativa, which I'm leaving out for now. I mean, this really became long enough. We might talk about the penalties which are draconian with up to 30 million euro or six percent of the worldwide turnover this this is really like gdpr style penalties and you know this is not unproblematic because when you have established a very very high limit of a penalty then for the punished entity, it becomes nearly impossible to fight harsh punishment. Because even if you get um, a, a punishment of, you know, 300,000 euro, th they could even say, yeah, but this was just 1% just of what we could have inflicted or something like that, you know? So, so when you have very high penalty limits it, it becomes difficult for you when you are punished to, to challenge that punishment and, and so you cannot really fight an injustice of, of the fines because the fines normally will be kept in the in the per single percent a fraction of a percent area and, and you can say you know we have shown like 90, 99, 99.9% .9 leniency. So, so what are you complaining about? While inflicting at you, uh, like on you, really, really harsh uh, punishments. Moreover, you may have an issue with, uh, with constitutional equality here. Because when you're having laws which establish punishments and these, you know, these fines, are then then exercised typically in some certain percentage you can say like i don't know light punishment is just 10 percent of the top fine medium things go in the area between 30 and 50 percent and so on and so forth then it would be sort of unfair or unequitable to say that um in 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 some areas fines are just single digit fines right so it may create the legal uncertainty of maybe these fines could just really be raised a hundred times. You know, like if, if they give you just one promil fine of the 20 or 30 million, which, which, which you may uh, be hit with, then maybe at some point they really can start fining you for like 5 million or, or 7 million or something like that, which for many entities would be truly ruinous. So, do not underestimate the the fines and and the well the possibilities which which these things open for well unjust treatment in 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 many regards and after we have been a little bit here in the well let's call it crazier part of the EU AI act like it starts nice but they're really the final provisions mm, i'm skeptic about Let's get to something perhaps a little bit more normal again, namely the definition of high-risk AI systems. Well, substantially, these are mostly systems of remote biometric identification, management of critical infrastructures like, like roads, traffic, gas, water, electricity, and so on and so forth, access 
to to important resources such as education, employment, benefits, migration, asylum, and things like that, as well as law enforcement systems such as polygraphs, etc. As mentioned, this Annex 3 may be updated by the Commission, so expect that... Um, I don't expect them to drop systems, frankly, but maybe further systems may be added. I mention that in particular because rumor has it that the whole EU AI Act thing is a little bit held back by the emergence of generative AI. For generative AI is not very well covered by the present stance of the draft. And maybe they will still want to see whether adjustments might be necessary in view of the recent technical developments we have all witnessed. And I'm finally going to Annex 4, the technical documentation. There, some of the like requirements may be a little bit strange, you know. So you need to provide an exact description of the functioning and architecture and design of the high-risk AI system, descriptions of the data acquisition and preparation approaches, plus installation and use instructions. You also need to provide a detailed description of the post-market surveillance system in place, and even the persons developing the system shall be named. I mean, why? <laughs> And, you know, like, other than that, you do not really have explicit duties going towards the persons developing the system. So why are you having a duty to name them here? Like, why is their identity so important? Or are they going to be judged as providers according to the definition of provider also as a natural person? Like, what exactly is the relevancy of the naming of the persons? And in case a high-risk AI system is integrated into a product, you're even expected to provide photographs of that system. I mean, imagine that you're having something which is downloaded into a computer, which then, for instance, operates some sort of machinery. What shall you do? present photos of the computer tower, like what it looks like, because it has been just integrated into it, right? <laughs> I don't know. So this, this, this whole thing I regard as a little bit strange. But when you read these requirements, think through how exactly you can prove that you fulfill these requirements. And Imagine what would apply to different system types, different constructs of technical nature, and, and different use scenarios, as well as different contracting scenarios. All in and all, you will discover, at least that was my experience, that it is very, very hard for any provider to be able to reliably state, yes, I know, I fulfill all requirements of the EU AI Act. In particular, as you have to consider real world scenarios with interaction with other systems, other parties, other purposes, and so on and so forth. So all in all, this is piece of legislation with a lot of indeterminate legal constructs whose exact operation will have to be observed in practice in order to be even halfway sure what you're really doing there. But until then, of course, we have to see the EU Act really becoming law. So far, I'm just commenting a proposal. And until then, of course, things may change again. And with that, our review of the proposal of the EU AI Act is over. I thank you very much for listening into this episode. 
I hope you will join in here again. Until we meet again, I wish you a wonderful time. And from me, goodbye and thank you.